How many times have you heard a radio host say, I wish our listeners could have heard the conversation I had with our guest during the break? I've heard it and said it many times over the years. That is where this podcast was born. We'll go in deeper with our guests to find out more about them and learn life lessons from some influential people. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe and share as well as rate and review the podcast on iTunes. I'm Clint Powell. This is During the Break. Let's do it. Hey, welcome to During the Break Podcast. I am Clint Powell. I appreciate you finding the podcast. I appreciate you tuning in. appreciate you uh, listening. Looking forward to you sharing it. Hope you enjoy these. You know, they say sometimes in life, the third time is the charm. With me, the second time is the charm with at least two or three of my guests. One of the first guys I ever had, as a matter of fact, the first person I ever interviewed was a great interview. Unfortunately, you, the listener, will never hear that interview. I had to get him in twice. So I've wasted two hours of this guy's life to get one good hour of interview. None other than the three-time All-Pro NFL running back, Gerald Riggs. How you doing, sir? Well, I'm back. That's all that matters. <laughs> I'm back. I'm good, though. Uh, he like he you gave say, me we, the stink eye when he walked yeah, in. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, that's that's kind of old habit with stuff. You know, you know when some guys <laughs> kind of uh, – you didn't rub me the wrong way with it. It was just the fact that I'm back here again to do this. Absolutely. Uh, but you know what? I'm, I'm thankful and grateful that you uh, want to come back and do it again. You just didn't, you know, kind of shelve it and say, ah, uh, we'll just move on. So, no. I, I'm, uh, it was a good interview. Very appreciative of it. No, it was a good interview. That's the frustrating part about this thing is mm-hmm. I learned to do it. It was you, uh, Dr. David Banks, mm-hmm. and then Scott Chase from KZ 106. Cool. Yeah, three great right. guys. They, they came all, back too? Dr. Banks has already done his. Okay, You're the all second right. one, and I'm supposed all to get Scott Chase in uh, pretty soon. He's, his time is just a little crazy. But with that being said, so far, I'm two for three okay. of having people willing to come back in. Scott is Scott's on the hook. So all right. It's a good interview. Here's what I want to do, though. Do me a favor. Tell everybody a little bit and where you grew up, where you played football at, because today I'm going to ask you some football questions like a fan, mm-hmm. but then I want to talk to you a little bit about life after football, lessons we all can learn from, and kind of get a little bit behind the scenes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm originally a Louisiana boy, born in northeast Louisiana, a place called Tallula. Sometimes it, people will see on the card or something, they have Toulouse, Toulouse or something, but it's Tallula. Tallula, Louisiana, just in between uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi and Monroe, Louisiana. So uh, that's where I was born. Mother took me at a very young age away from there, uh, looking for better job opportunities and whatnot, and took my brother and I to Las Vegas, Nevada, where I grew up there. That's kind of where I where my stomping grounds were formulated. And I say that real, real loosely, but, you know, I grew up in that crazy town. Uh, they, they call it Sin City. And as me growing up as a young man, I found everything that was possible out there to do. Got involved with a little bit of everything until I ran across some very, very dear people to not only to my family, but myself. And a guy by the name of Kenny Gwynn, who was, you know, God rest his soul, was the guy who got me off the kind of off the street, so to speak. I started playing basketball at a young age, uh, played on all star teams with his son. Mm-hmm. And uh, we formulated a great relationship when uh, actually when I was almost lost my blessing with um, with football because I didn't really gel with a head coach. New school, all that sort of stuff. That's another story in itself. Right. Almost missed that blessing, but Kenny Gwynn and his son and I, we uh, both went to Arizona State together, and uh, he went on to be the big businessman and land guy, and uh, I went ahead and played football. So going to Arizona State, being a um, first-round draft pick to the Atlanta Falcons, which I didn't see coming, uh, knowing that I was in the same Draft class as guys by the name of Joe Morris played with the Giants. Oh, yeah. Uh, Walter Abercrombie played with, I think Walter played with Pittsburgh. There was a guy named Barry Redden who went with the Rams. Of course, Marcus Allen. Butch Woolfolk uh, came out of Michigan. I played with some guys that, you know, tailback-wise, they were all pretty much the cream of the crop. Right. And I was a fullback. The thing that I remember most about that is that Frank Cush, who I played with, in co- who was my college coach, told me that, you know, when I got there, he said, Gerald, you know, I've got fast running backs. I've got guys who are world-class sprinters and all the whole bit, but you are the you would be the biggest back that I have. Well, the second biggest back. The first one was a fullback already that, that was there, uh, who was a senior. And he said, if I went to fullback, that I would probably uh, do very, very well when it came time to NFL 
you know, draft time. Right. I didn't really, you know, I wouldn't, I was still a young guy at football. Really only played really one year of high school football. That's amazing. Uh, so, you know, when that happened at the end of my four years there, which we didn't have, you know, the three years and done or whatnot, we didn't have all that stuff in place. But after my four years there, ended up being the number ninth pick in the draft ahead of Marcus Allen, who actually won the Heisman Trophy. That's kind of a, how it all started. Real quick, back in the yeah. day, though, when you were drafted, was it the ceremony that it is now? Was it nowhere close? That's what I was, you know. We had, as a matter of fact, <laughs> the year that I was drafted was the first year of the combines, uh, oh, and, really? we, and it was nowhere near structured like it is now. It's a, you know big pomp and circumstance with all this, and you know bringing everybody in, a and, camera you know, in everybody's face, everybody's face, the social media outlets, and all of that. We had none of that. As a matter of fact, when I was drafted, I was playing pinballs at at a pizza place that was right around. <laughs> corner from my apartment and uh you know that's just how it was we didn't have cell nobody phones called you, don't, you yeah. know no but uh, i'm sitting there look, uh, playing pinball and the, one of the one of my friends who worked at the restaurant you know had to be watching you know the draft on the tv and that day they had the guys walk up to the podium with you know the commissioner and give them a card Piece or whatnot, paper, whatever and they you know announced his name but nobody was there to actually walk up on stage or anything it was so, just for tv yeah, yeah, it was just for tv and you know the guys screaming and hollering at me you know gerald you've been drafted you know you, you do you know you were drafted what and i'm like i'm about to get mean? a free game man yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm like, you know what? My points are going away right now. You know, stop messing you know, with me. Yeah, I, I need, I need to focus. So. You know, I run back to my apartment and stuff, you know, and uh, sure enough, my, my agent, a call, left a message on a machine and called him back, and that's where it all started. A machine. It's been a minute since yeah, I've heard yeah, that. I, I know. Hey, kiddos, if machine. you're listening, we used to have these answer things machine. called answer machines. Yeah. yeah. We yeah, could the, screen calls that, that way. We didn't have a, a 100% attend, uh, nowhere near. accessibility yeah. back yeah. then. Yeah. So you get drafted, mm-hmm. and you go to the Falcons. And what I want to do, just just so we have a little structure, I want to walk through just a little bit about your NFL yeah. career. Sure. Then we'll, I want to transition to talk about now because we're more than just our past Mm -hmm. you get drafted by the falcons they already had a running back sure did that i was Mm -hmm. you know i remember watching him and and i thought william andrews Mm -hmm. is the guy i watched and i always said this and of course i'm the guy that was the fan but william andrews to me was kind of a smaller version and he may have actually been bigger i don't know but kind of a smaller version that ran kind of like uh, earl campbell Mm -hmm. you know he was just a real powerful running back or william andrews real powerful running back and I just remember when I started watching you, because did you get a lot of playing time your first year? Did you take over immediately? First year, no. I mean, right, not right off the back. I, I, when I came in, it was pretty much all William. Yeah. And then he gets a knee injury. Uh, that's and, it, I, yep. that's, and that's when I took over. Well, um, I just remember never really, I didn't hear of you, you know, because back when I, that was when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I didn't know about the draft. I just know all of a sudden these players, you know, popped up on the teams that I like. You just ran so hard. Mm-hmm. And the first podcast we had, and I want to bring some stuff up because some of it's good enough for me to remind us of and talk about. You ran with a little bit of aggression, didn't you? Uh, It was more than aggression. (laughs) It was a result and the years of being frustrated as a broken young man. Yeah. And finally finding an outlet that suited me. And even in my testimony, as I talk about later on, how I became to be a believer in Christ and that those years, I didn't realize that I was as angry as I was. So to finally get into football and for it to be pretty much my uh, my launching pad right. was something that uh, I never saw coming. And I, and I really, even when I went to college uh, my first year, I wasn't really even focused on football. It was, you know, okay, I'm, I have an opportunity to get here and, you know, go to school and all that sort of stuff and got a, a freshman award academically and, but it was it wasn't really my you know in my forefront of to be a successful football player. You didn't it, grow it up saying I can't wait to be in the NFL. No, yeah. I, I didn't do that. It was uh, again, it was something that I found that I was more pleased with going out and playing hard, and at the end of it uh, with a game, it just seemed like as though I was at a calm afterwards. Right. It was almost as if to say, you know, I, all right, the, the tornado is gone now, and now the, it's uh, it's finally subsided. That's kind of like the the feel that I had. I, I was. It was therapy. It was it. Bottom line, that's yeah. what it was. It was therapy for me. I didn't realize that early on. You know, after a few years and years of playing and going on down the road, and then finally coming to where I, you know, went out and found a little bit of help for myself. Yeah. Because I know that I was, you know, there was something there. I, I wasn't sure. But find out that football basically was therapy for me. And I, and that's the way I played the game. Very um, violent. A lot very of, angry. You and, played in a world with, the, with I can't picture you being the only guy having that story, though. Yeah. I, you know what? And there were a lot of guys there. And then there yeah. were and other reasons, too. Some guys, you know, that even in my day, much as the NFL doesn't want to say, there were guys who were messing with the juice and all that oh, sort yeah. of stuff. So there were a lot of different situations. But mine, I, I have to say I was the cleanest one, was, maybe. But it's a <laughs> but, violent sport built but, for violent moments. Yeah, Impact. it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Did you like it? Did you? Because I've got buddies that played in college, mm-hmm. and they played all the way through college. But it was really odd. We would start talking, and then somewhere around the second or third year of college, they've been playing since. They, and you said you didn't start till later in life, but mm-hmm. they a lot of those guys have been playing since they were seven. Mm-hmm. They just started saying it was like a job. They were like, man, and they were playing at big-name schools, mm-hmm. and I would talk to them, and they'd be like, man, I love doing it still, but it's so, so it's like a job. Mm-hmm. I know it was a job, but did you enjoy doing it too? Did you look forward to playing time? There were times where I, I'd have to say I, I relished going out and intimidating people. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to as a running back. I was big enough to do so. And guys, when they came out, you know, there were times where, you know, before game, I'd come out to warm up. And uh, I'd come out and I'd have my socks pulled down and oil, you know, legs all oiled up and the calves popping. And, yeah. You know, to do push-ups and stuff in the locker room. You, you know, you all you get, all out and, yeah, get all swolled <laughs> up. And this is just warm up. You know, yeah. I had a thing where I would just come out and, you know, when we come out, most of the guys on our team or either team kind of stay on their side of the field and warm up. I took it as, a, you know, a thing to, again, to intimidate. I run through the other team's warm-up, you know, just jog through. I mean, just just, just jog and walk through it and just to let them see that, you know what, it's going to be a long day. You know? a, hope y'all brought lunch. So, y'all bring yeah, snacks? Bring a lunch box, but, snacks, lunch box right? because it's going to be a long day. That was just part of the game. It, you know, and I had equated sometimes to maybe what, what the what wrestlers do. Wrestlers. Absolutely. Uh, not wrestlers, wrestlers. Wrestlers. There's a difference between a wrestler and a wrestler. Absolutely. Okay? We're talking about <laughs> so, Ric Flair and yeah, woo. Yeah. We're talking those wrestlers. So, yeah. yeah. You, so, it, it, it was kind of like that's that's what I did. It's you know, my I, game. I went out there and tried to do that. And it is. It's Because a mind they try to play mind games on me. Well, that's just I mean, the as other a running back, had to have somebody that was willing to As a running back, they're all trying to play mind games on you. You know, uh, telling you, you know, about fumbling the ball and, you know, we're going to kick your tail today. You know, you're going to... Uh, Look you know, at you that's cleaning that's the language stuff. up. That's so very nice I'm, I'm of trying you cleaning to. that language. I really... But, you know, what? I, can, I can say things on here, but I'm, I'm still trying to... I'm a changed <laughs> man, okay? That's good. I'm a changed we man. We all know what I, they know. were probably saying. And as a matter of fact, funny story real quick. When I was up in D.C., we were with a family reunion. And I was in the car, and we were joking around, clowning around with some of the other parents and stuff. Uh, my wife's cousin said something to me, and I kind of responded. And I used a curse word, you know, but we were joking. Yeah. We were clowning around, and the kids were looking like, oh, we never heard him. <laughs> you know, curse, whatever. I'm like, you just don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, God is good. That's yeah, going to leave it at that. So, but anyway. For second chances yeah, for everybody. It, it, was a, it was an intimida- intimidation factor that you had to have, you know, when you're out there as a running back. Earl Campbell had it. Walter Payton had it. There were some guys, you know, out there on the field, you know, defensively. Lawrence Taylor, guys that I can mention off the top of my head quite a bit that you knew that they had that intimidating factor when they went out there on the play. And that's what I like to do. I, well, that's I, I when love they to get started in, in the 80s, miking up players. And, you know, they put the mics on them and yeah. you could hear them mm-hmm. talk. You know, I grew up on the ball fields, but it was at, up to a certain level. But as a fan, it's really cool to hear people at your caliber, your level, still, mm-hmm. whether you had fun or not, Y'all were still playing the same game oh, yeah. we were playing on the pickup field. Mm-hmm. You know, you're still talking eyeballing. Talking a bunch of crap. I don't even know why you showed trash. up today. You know I'm yeah. going to run your direction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you might Who was well the best trash ready. talker that you played against? Who was oh one of the best God. trash talkers? Um, i tell you what. There was there were quite a few. Uh, Matt Millen, uh, linebacker. He was with the Raiders. and yeah. He played with the Skins for a little bit, too. Tom Jackson. Uh, really? ESPN uh, broadcast with uh, yeah. Tom Jackson. Uh, he was one. Um, played for the Broncos, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, played with the Broncos. Oh, gosh almighty. Um, was Lawrence Taylor a big talker? Lawrence, Lawrence was, you know, he, he would, Lawrence was a guy that if you provoked him into talking, he wouldn't say a whole lot. Right. You know, but he'd make comments, you know, all the time when, you know, and you, you probably heard him sometime with some of the, the little sound bites that he's had, you know, about, you know, guys, you, you got to do better. You got to do you know, better. Yeah. Now. He'll say some things, you know, when, when, when it kind of provoked to. I'll tell you but, this, the ones that used to mic up the old schools, the Ditka, uh, not Ditka, uh, Dick Butkus and mm-hmm. Lambert. Yeah. I remember those guys when they, they mic'd those guys up. A little up. different, a little different. <laughs> Uh, mindset those guys but i thoroughly enjoyed hearing some of those conversations that those guys are having on the field because i can i can relate to it right throughout the game there are a lot of guys that just talk noise all the time i mean like you you can't be out there as one guy and i'm saying that all 11 guys out there somebody's going to say something somebody's going to go off somebody's going to do something that somebody gets ticked off about right and it, it's on after that baby it, it's on <laughs> give me the ball i'm going that oh, direction that's not just did you, me. Ever, did, you ever, <laughs> did you ever change the call in the huddle did you ever ask hey i want to go back that direction uh, give me there, that ball there, you know, there have been times where you come in and, you, and it's like you know i've hit a guy you know and it's like you know what let's just run it back that, that same way you know it's like the quarterback come in and you're calling i'm like no 
Hey, let's run it the same way again. And the linemen will be kind of looking at you kind of with a little smirk on their face like, yeah. They we, know why. Yeah. They're like, okay, let's go get, let's go back at it again, G. And, um, but yeah, there, there have been times when, uh, when you do that. Well, I, I mean, like all of those things exist. I mean, people, some of these movies that they've had, the North Dallas 40s and all that sort of stuff, it kind of, it kind of overdo it because, you know, we still play with a, a there was a great deal of respect too, though. Uh, but it was man on man. Yeah, I mean, like it was, it was a man's game. You can couldn't go out there and, and kind of be peddling around or not doing what you needed to do to to win to win the game. So, a couple of questions as the fan, yeah. and then we go, we'll transition. But all right, sure. the trash talking aside, who were a couple of the folks that you ran into? Linebackers, defensive linemen, defensive backs that you were like, whoo, those guys bring some that game bring a load. I was, I don't know what we were talking about last time, but oh, I'm Clint, gonna bring Clint, it back up in a minute. I, um, I guess because of my size. And because of my my quickness and and, and strength, it, it wasn't something that I I really got hit a whole lot. Even sometimes when I still try to think back, you know, who really you know socked me pretty good. There were there were some times when I got hit. Yeah. But, you know, you're going to get hit, and I never equated it to really being you know a whole lot. You're but supposed there's to. There's yeah. one guy who I can truthfully say that, and we played against him twice a year. And his name was Sam Mills. That's who. Yeah. And Sam Mills was the guy. He was he was the shorter than most of the linebackers that I played against the Singletaries, Lawrence Taylors, uh, Otis Wilsons, and Pat Swillings. I mean, even on his team, well, they had four of the best linebackers probably in the league that they just didn't uh, because of their team not winning very often defensively. They that was, great they defense. Were, woo, they was, was he about something. five nine? He probably was about five, five eight. nine, five eight, yeah. somewhere around there. But he was a load, uh, and, and only because you couldn't get underneath him. Lyman couldn't get underneath him. He'd get underneath the offensive line. And he could sneak around. I mean, a lot of times you wouldn't see him till the last minute, right? The last minute is when I would see him. I mean, the last second, just when I see a hole open up and I'm going to accelerate and he comes out of nowhere and pops me right in the thigh or right in the gut or something, and I would get up and just look at him, and then he'd just look at me and just have that look like, the look that I would try to give people to intimidate them, he would give it to me. And I'm like, Sam, you know, I, I, every time I see him and I get up off the ground, I'm like, damn you, Sam. And he, it was just every, every time we played smile, game, like, yeah. he was the one who just all the time, all, always gave me more problems. And all the other linebackers, the Chicago and all that, was playing against Singletary and him, those big eyes and all well, that see, sort that's of stuff. See, that's the other guy. When I brought uh, his name up, he didn't want that. Up, that's bro. what you, you're saying no. it again. I, I think no, that's one of the didn't. greatest things ever. But no, he, he was tough. No doubt about it, but I know for a fact that, you know, he was one of those guys, and he came in the middle. He didn't bring it like that. Sam was a different breed of guy altogether. Right. And Singletary, maybe some games he did, maybe some other running backs he did, but <clears> I <throat> took it personal against those Bear teams, especially the 85 Bear teams. And, yeah. You know, and we think we played them 85 and 86, something like 86 and 84, 85 and 84. One or two, we played them two back-to-back -back years. <laughs> the, the one guy on that team who I probably say was who got me – and it wasn't a it wasn't an outright tackle. It was as much as it was that he came he he came on a screen and he snuck. He, let's put it this way: he did a little sneaky, and that he cheated on a on the play. He said, "How can a defensive guy be cheating? He made yeah. a tackle." Yeah. Well, this guy was he was supposed to go a different direction. Uh, we thought, and he came back, and that was the fridge. Oh, and I caught a screen pass, and uh, and. Before I knew it, I was on the ground, and I mean, the air just literally went out of my body. And I just knew <laughs> that. Big man. And I just knew who it was. I'm like, it can't be just one person that's just the fridge. And sure enough, I roll over, and he's looking at me with that big old smile. And, and I'm like, get your big ass off of me. I'm get, like, get yeah, away. Was, but no, I, you know, going back to that, me and Ronnie Lillard had some battles. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, he. Wow, he wound up putting me on a big hit reel that still to this day I, I chuckle about because we saw each other probably, oh, it, it may have been a couple of years after that was done. We were both out of the game. Yeah. We come into this convention as, you know, all the NFL alumni guys. We played against each other in college, not just in the NFL. Him being at USC and me at Arizona State. Right. But when I see him at this convention, it's like our, our eyes just locked all of a sudden across the way at this convention. And he just looked at me. He's like, I didn't do it. You know, <laughs> I didn't put it together. Somebody else put it together. And he knew exactly what I was going to say when I, when I saw it because I had knocked him out. You know, cold like three, I think maybe four times right. uh, in games. But and, the one yeah. good one he's got on tape, the he one throws he's got, you in there. But in the one that he got me was one where he split. He, he Actually, it was supposed to be it was a screenplay. And my offensive lineman, one supposed to kick out, one supposed to take up one guy off the field. And they totally missed him. And as I was catching the ball, he had gotten through and caught me just before I, I turned around. Hit me in the, you know, hit me in the, in the upper body, but I lost my balance it, more so than it was a great hit. Right. And they put that on the big reel. And it I, looked good. It, it looked good. Well, he could hit though. It squared up. No doubt about that it. Dude, he he put the would, lights out. Yeah, he would hit. He and uh, I think there was Atwater who was there. There was another one named uh, Fulcher. Oh yeah, uh, who actually went to Arizona State. Well, too. he was bigger too. Fulcher, he was big. He was a monster. He was a monster. Was he, he played was probably 
strong about safety. Strong safety, yeah. right? 230, 240. It was an absolute beast. But you know, I didn't get a chance to really you know, go up against him. But those guys, man, I respect them, love them as people and players that I played with. But they would put your lights out they of you would. if you didn't bring it. The training, and, and there's two things I want to talk about. I want to transition yeah. from back then to now. The training that you guys had and that you did, kind of, I'm sure it was a, a notch up from what everybody else was doing. In other words, I grew up on Nautilus machines, right? Mm-hmm. Free weights and just basic gyms. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming that when you guys were in the pros at the same time, you had an elevated gym. You guys had the best of everything. But if you look at the best of everything in the 70s and 80s versus the best of everything nowadays, when you look at the training, do you ever wish that you go, I wish we had that back then? Do you look at that and go, man, the nutrition and the weight training and the just the knowledge we have, would it have made a big difference, you think? I think um, the biggest part of it is, is nutritionally. Back in the day, you either understood that you ate for strength You ate for your bulk, your endurance, maybe. Right. But we didn't eat right uh, all the time. Uh, And there were, you know, even though there were programs out there that kind of help us with it, it's it's nowhere near as finite as it is now. Right. Equipment wise and whatnot, we had, um, uh, we were kind of like on the on the beginning of the technological side of it. We had air machines. There were air machines. I remember when they first came along where, you know, it was putting air pressure in machines like almost kind of like, what is it, hydraulics or, or something in certain machines. And we were, you know, it was all resistance yeah. stuff. It was, was good. Dynamic resistance. It gets stronger, as you, harder as you push it out. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, some of those things like that. So I think for what they do right now with some of the training, they overdo it. I think some of these guys here, and my son is in the business too, and he's taking some of the old school cues from me with when I as far as when he works with some of these kids and you know it's about them with the flexibility it's about them with their natural ability to try to be as best they can be and not going through all these other different stuff because you can't train a receiver like an offensive lineman you can't have him go through the same program and do the same things a, a linebacker and, and a running back are similar in ways, but you still have to, you know, to work them in in certain aspects, you know, for their position. So I think what, when I when I look at what these people do, they'll say, okay, come and work with me because I'm this such and such trainer. You go to that session, they've got a girls basketball player, an offensive lineman, a gymnast, track guy, baseball guy, all of these lined up doing the exact same thing. You can't train them that way. Right. I really, truly believe in, in sports-specific training. You know, you you got to be able to look at what you're doing with that person for what they do in their sports because there's different movements, different ways that you're going to help them develop. And then also, too, that, you know, I, I, I really wish that some of these people would stop, these trainers who come out and they, they want to they wanna do everything by, this, by a book or a film or whatnot and think that they're going to say, well, we're going to make your kid better through this. God gave you the ability to get better. Okay, if you're going to get better, it's going to be on what you're doing to help your body get ready. You're not going to do it again after doing the same exercises that you're doing for the the ice skater, (laughs) you know, all that sort of stuff. I think that's why you've seen so many injuries. There weren't, that as, there weren't as many. There weren't, yeah, and as I said, they're overdoing it. Yeah. And that's why I say, you know, we didn't have those many issues back in the day. Back in the day when we were players, I mean, guys would play a full season, and, you know, we can get back on the field. And we, I mean, because injury is going to happen. But it wasn't this length of time. We weren't tearing Achilles all the time. We weren't, you know, having um, career injuries, knee injuries as much as it is happening now. I mean, you're seeing uh, injuries now that I'm like, wow, you know, a guy is in the off season. Getting hurt. And it's happening now at a younger age. Yes. I'm seeing and, my, and my daughter's already had knee stuff. surgery. She's 14. And they're in the off season getting hurt. I think that any athlete who's dedicated to whatever sport that they're in, they owe it to themselves to take time to heal. Rest. When you're in the off season or whatnot, get your rest. Get back to the point to where you can perform at an optimum level and not having literally the, the hangover from what you did the year before, injury-wise. And it happens a lot these days. It was a different mindset, different way. I, I mean, me and the old school stuff, I wasn't a really a big weightlifting guy. I was blessed and gifted with a lot of strength. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can go in there and I can bench like 510 pounds even though I wasn't a bench guy. I wasn't a weight guy. I was just naturally strong and, and you know, just, just gifted. By the way, beha- on behalf of all us normal folks, that just yeah. pisses me off. But you keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> even though you're between me and the door. I got a back door over here. I'll get out quick. I just want you to know when you say it, just like, oh, I can still. You know, I just want you to know I worked really hard to get my 335 bench. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> just because you bitched you know, what I squatted. I don't want to well, talk to you, you know, know, This was, interview's over. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're, I get it. Yeah, but, you know, people, but that's why you were at the level you were at. Yeah. 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 And, you know, when most guys, when we worked out together, we worked out in ways that would help each other. I loved running with the receivers. 
you know, when it came to sprints and stuff, whatever. No, they did. Some of them were just outright fast or whatever. But that helped me out, you know, from a standpoint of the speed wise. Yeah. Endurance wise, I, I would outdoors them, endure them. You know, some of them were just great as far as what they did in the routes wise. But it was a whole different mindset, a whole different dynamic with the way that we train. Everybody these days, they have everything they can possibly want. You got the gym, you've got the, the diet plans, you've got the you know, nutrition wise and all that, you got the equipment. You just show all that sort meat. of stuff. Yeah, I mean, and it's great, but I think it's spoiled. Well, I think Today's it all goes back to though. the basics, too. It's really funny because the other day I was talking to somebody. It was somebody on Facebook was somebody doing plyometrics. And I hadn't heard plyometrics in 20 years. But love not, it. Love that plyometrics stuff. was yeah. body weight with explosive movements. I would love and, that stuff. And it mm-hmm. was. And, and now I start seeing some of the stuff people put mm-hmm. out that they're doing, mm-hmm. and they're calling it all these different things. Yeah. I go, that's still plyometrics. That's still plyometrics. <laughs> it's You're still right. jumping the You're hurdles, right. the one foot up the mm-hmm. bleacher skips. Mm-hmm. It's still plyometrics. Mm-hmm. It's what we used to do. The training is a lot different, but the expectations of practice, too. And I'll say this to you, and I think you'll you'll smile, but do you get a lot of water breaks in the 70s when you were playing football in the 80s? What was that? Water break? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We had what they call a salt tablet. <laughs> and uh, they had a big old cup of salt tablets, and you go and you throw a couple in your mouth with a drink of a glass of Golly. water, and you get out there and play in it or practice. Uh, a water break, there was never anybody stopped to say, you know, hey, you guys take a break of water. It was like, well, you, you better go and get you some. Did you have people falling out left and right? Because it seems like if they do that now, people no. fall out all the time. No, no, we didn't. I just, it, it, I, and, I, and that's so weird. Uh, you know, evolution. No, it never happened like that. Guys would get tired to the point where afterwards or whatnot, we would go in and, I mean, we would just be zapped out. You'd land down in the locker room or whatever in the cool air, mm. and you're sucking around every water. And I, I, I remember when I was in camp in college at Arizona State, we were up in uh, Tanazona where we were up in Payson, Arizona, where we had our camp. And we had a natural spring. Oh. And the spring was, I mean, it was cold water the whole time. And I think all together in, in an area, probably about 25, 30 yards wide, like the spring was. And I mean, like you're talking about guys after practice, we would go and just literally lay on the side of the pool of the, the spring <laughs> and just put our head in there and just be sucking water up because we didn't get those water breaks. I mean, right. they have guys walk around with a little tube, give you a blast of, you know, water or whatnot. And, and that was pretty much, that was about it. And you, you didn't know? ask. No, no, you didn't. Can I get I mean, some water? No, what did you know. just ask? Did I it was it? different, man. Man, and the right. coaches were the old school. But that doesn't make um, it better. That part no, of it no, 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 better no, now. No, no, no. It's, it's we're better smarter. now. Yeah. Because, you know, these kids here now and, and most of the young people now, they need it because, again, they're not out in the elements as much as we were as players back in our well, day. We, just, we were outside a lot. Yeah, let's just take football out of it. We, When I grew up and you grew up, we were, you know, we wouldn't, we didn't want to stay in the house. You better go outside no. and play. You better go outside. Don't sit around the house all day or whatnot. Uh, and mom, that's, what, and that's would, what my mom would say and, uh, to me. I'll find something for you. Your butt outside and and uh, go find yeah go do something or whatnot. And about the time the sun went down, I'd start hearing uh, we'd hear oh, all the moms around the neighborhood yeah, calling. Oh yeah, here oh, goes yeah. the dark. And then, yeah, and then yeah. you'd be like, where you been? Our mother, our mother's voice it was almost like a song when she put our, our names. They together. could all yell at once, yeah. and everybody could pick out theirs. They knew it. And mm-hmm. and but you know it's funny you say that. Not only do kids not get out, I don't think I'd let my kid do that now. You know, I look in the world we live in. I think we've created a world. My my son's nineteen. My daughter's fourteen. I didn't let them go run. Maybe it's the mm-hmm. neighborhoods I lived in. I there's, a, there's a paranoia. Uh, I mean, it's, and certainly it's that way because of what's going on in society. Yeah. You know, every time you look around, there's people who are evil people in this world. Uh, and me and my wife talk about it all the time that there's just so many people who just don't mean any good for anybody. They'll hurt whomever they so, so choose. And it, it's no picking and choosing. It's just it seems as though they just do it at a drop of a dime. If it hits them, it hits them. It's just evil people in it this is world. and i don't know my neighbors like i used to no it's like when no, we grew none up, of us do my mom and none dad we do. knew everybody six houses both directions and both sides of the road and the people the next door behind us we, we don't we knew that not only the, the the people on our street two streets over the next street and all down of them the could spank us boys and, and girls and <laughs> all of them all of them had an inside <laughs> track on if there was if you did something they knew how to get in touch with your mom and it was and back you know, home before you got there and uh you better believe it uh you know so It's nowhere near like that anymore. We don't live in that kind of society where that neighborhood love really exists. Now it's it's like, well, uh, that's my neighbor, but I don't know anything about them. Sometimes you just you come outside to your mailbox. Some of them don't even yeah, they barely even wave to you. Maybe yeah. So it's it's an entirely different society now. We used to have people come by. You remember we used to stop and visit. We had people knock Mm -hmm. on our door and just saying, "Hey, we just we're just in the neighborhood." Now we knock on the door. We all look through the window and start going, yeah, baby, quiet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it is sad. It I really miss is. those times. Yeah. It's, it's in a different time, man. Yeah. I mean, like we, there's so many things I can go back and talk about, you know, back in the old day like that, but 
It's just not that time, not that that time anymore. How long were you with the Falcons? Seven years. Did you just not sign and get re-signed with the, uh, the Redskins, or did you get traded? I was traded. I had that feeling. I was traded. I think that was the first time that I really went through some personal issues. <laughs> Right in life because I didn't see it coming. Uh, it was never talked about. It was never spoken of. I still remember the day of the draft. I was sitting on the sofa after being out carousing one night, the night before the draft with all my buddies and uh, having a few adult beverages and whatnot and waking up that next morning and thinking, well, I wonder what we're going to do because they didn't involve key players in a draft like they do nowadays. Right. Yeah, so like a guy, if, you know, if he feels like he's a, a key player on the team, he's like, well, you know, let me know what you guys are going to do so I can uh, position myself contract-wise, or, you know, anything like that. So I wake up the next morning. I, I think this was just divine intervention on that part because I woke up two, I think it was two teams before the Falcons were up on the clock. That's when I found out that they were talking about a trade. So me being there, again, laying there on the sofa with, you know, sunshades on and, you know, in the morning, uh, too bent to get up and close the good curtains or whatnot. I'm saying to myself, who in the world are we going to trade? <laughs> How is, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking and going through, you start going all through the, the roster. Don't yeah, you? Like, who can we afford to lose? I'm, I'm thinking of the guys, you know, on the team, you know, why don't, and I'm like, nah, we wouldn't trade him. No, no, I don't. Who in the world are we going to trade? So the Falcons are on the clock. Whitey Zimmerman, God rest his soul, was the guy who always took the card up to the commissioner. Marion Campbell was our head coach at the time. And I get a call from Marion Campbell just as they're talking about Whitey Zimmerman, you know, where at least the Falcons are on the clock. And he's, you know, Gerald, how you doing? And I'm coach, you know, how you doing, I coach? He said, well, Gerald, we're going to trade you. We hear that you're unhappy and we want to try to make you happy and we're going to try to do something to bolster our team and get some more players or whatever. And he's going on talking for about three minutes and I let him talk. And then I finally, when he shut up and gave me a time to say something, Coach, who told you I was unhappy? And where did this come from? And he said, well, that's just what we're going to do. And, we, you know, we hope you have a great career there. And, and uh, bye. <laughs> Hung the phone up on me. And I'm sitting there just, like, sobered up. Like, I mean, it just left, like. So here's I, I the, here's just, a tip. If you're ever uh, drunk and you want to get sober, get traffic, get, yeah, uh, get traded. Get traded. Yeah. Yeah. Sure enough, I'm sitting there watching this happen right in front of my eyes, man. It takes him up there, and the commissioner says, and the, you know, the Falcons trade running back Gerald Ricks to Washington Redskins, who was such and such, and I am like, holy cow, you know, and I'm next thing, you know, my phone blows up, and my parents are calling, and, you know, I talk to them, and then my agent's calling, and I'm like, did you know anything about it? Had anybody spoken to it? And my agent's like, no, we had, nobody's even reached out to us. That's how it happened. Next thing I know, I'm in Washington there with Ernest Biner, and it was the best thing that happened to me. That's my what career. I was looking um, back You know, on looking back on it, it was, I mean, like, I still felt that at the end, it was partially the way that I wanted to go out, but I wanted to win a championship in Atlanta. Right. I would have loved to have done that. This team that brought me there, and that's where I would have loved to have been able to win a championship at. But How uh, long were you, were you with the Redskins? Uh, just three years. You know, my fourth year there this was a year in camp, and that's when I decided to Call it quits. But yeah. What Super Bowl did you play in? Was that it, was twenty six, I believe. It was with uh, that was against the Bills. Yeah, it was well, one of Buffalo. That was with Jim in had Minnesota. his run, his three or four, his four or five year run. Jim, the uh, quarterback. Yeah, uh, I mean, but you know, everybody wants to talk it. about you know, oh, you know, the Buffalo Bills and all that. All Man, right. I tell you what, to be on a team to get back there four years in a row, almost five years in a row, whatever, that is amazing. And it's really, it's a shame that they couldn't win one of those. But right. they played against some. I, I mean, our team that the year we only lost two games and. And we were uh, probably the, one of the most prolific offenses in, in football history yeah. at that time. And so they came up against, on, on the other side, teams that were really, really well put together. Well, uh, not and to I say think that people like you can appreciate what it takes to get there. They did it yeah. four years in a row. Yeah, I think it was four years in a row. I think. There's people who played 20 years in the NFL Don't and get a didn't sniff. get there at all. Don't get a sniff of it. Yeah. Uh, so for all those players that played on those teams, the utmost respect for them. And a lot of those guys I know personally – it was kind of heart wrenching, you know, to see, you know, at the end of the game, they're like, man, you guys just couldn't put it all together, you know, again. But I'm glad, <laughs> was, you know, but, <laughs> they had you know, a, who was thing, their big know. defense? Like Bill uh, was not Bill Smith. Oh, oh no, you're talking Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith. Yeah, man, that guy. But they had, but the, the team that they had with 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 Tally, with no, not Tally. He was Daryl Tally was there. Daryl Tally, yeah, yeah, Tally, yeah. Uh, Cornelius Bennett, yeah, uh, Alabama boy, Bill Biscuit. He was I there. Loved him, man. Uh, I, I mean, they they were stocked yep. with with players, but they just couldn't get over the hump, man. Yeah, just couldn't get over. That's Marley, good stuff. Marley put together a great team, but it was just couldn't do it, man. Everybody that makes fun of them, those fans, they don't know 
what it takes to get there once. Yeah, and I, I hate to hear that, you know, because it, there's a lot that go into it uh, that people don't realize. Yeah. Uh, and like I say, we can we can sniff our nose up at them and show them the ring and all that sort of stuff, but I still really respect them for playing the way that they did. After you give them respect, you still get to say, I won. Oh, you know? uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's always feels good, right? Then you're in the NFL. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that transition because we've all read stats. It goes back to the people that win the lottery. You know, mm-hmm. when they win the lottery, I think the the average within three to five, seven years, they're either they're broke or back to worse mm-hmm. than the way they were. Mm-hmm. A lot of people look at people who play pro sports as kind of winning the lottery. Mm-hmm. You get to play something that I grew up playing, and you make a lot of money. I don't think people understand the dynamics. You're out there doing your job. There's people you have to trust to handle your business. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people aren't uh, up on what they should be looking for. So now you're out of football. Was it an easy transition, or was it really tough? It wasn't easy. Again, as I alluded to in the, in the early part of our conversation, how football was therapy for me. Yeah. No longer being able to have that type of environment around to function in was very difficult for me. Not to say that I positioned myself as only a football player, but it was that part of the game that you can't go out and duplicate in life. You can find other things to get into work-wise and all that sort of stuff. And I did. Uh, You know, I did uh, a lot of broadcasting. I worked in advertising. I worked in uh, a lot of other different things. But nothing gave me that therapy that I had in football. (laughs) I'm not not a dumb guy. I went to school and, you know, I did well and all that. But when you're looking for something else to substitute that, you exercise some demons that you didn't think that were there. With me, that's what it was. I, I went through different aspects of my life. I went through, you know, the divorce. I went through with different things. I went through, you know, going through. through. I had some pretty good jobs, but it was, you know, you you, you go through uh, depression, been through all of that. So I've been through the whole gamut of it all. You know, I had to really kind of get myself together uh, just to face the world sometimes. And, and I didn't do that right away. I mean, it, initially, like I said, I went through probably about, about five or six years of really what I felt was kind of like a personal hell. Kind yeah. of find your way just in the dark. Just find to find yeah. something that I really wanted to do or that I could say that, you know, I could be satisfied with this. And as you were satisfied with nothing. And I've had a lot of a lot of friends. We get together and play golf and we talk about these type of things. And I thought that I was a, kind of alone with it sometimes because I see other guys who are successful and doing things and they find other things off the, off the field. But, man, they were right in the same boat. It it was like, you know, they were doing it just because they had to do it. I can't imagine trying to fill that void every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I can't imagine filling the void because most of the locker room camaraderie, that that buddy-buddy, that ends for most people at age 18. Mm -hmm. You got to live that another 10 years, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so not only are you having to fill the, this is my family, but now I've got this adrenaline pump on Sundays. And when I walk in the store, everybody knows me. Mm-hmm. Well, over the next year or two, after, I can't imagine feeling that. And you, I know you say your identity wasn't as a football player, but it kind of was. You, that's what you yeah, were. That's what, yeah. you, that's what you did. You're right. And uh, you were young. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when still young. most people are just building their career, you're done. Yeah, yeah. It's at least that part how did of you, it. How did you navigate that? Did, I mean, eventually what pulled you through? You know, I'd like to be able to say that initially it it was faith that pulled me through, but I wasn't always a believer, and that didn't come along until later in my life. But I think that when I hit the hardest part of it, that's when I think that I allowed myself to kind of back off and and stop thinking so much about, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call them glory years or whatnot, but you have to really say that, put it in the rearview mirror. And let's move on with life. What's next? Yeah, let's, let's I really about focus this, on uh, what's next. A podcast a couple ago, how guys, I think, and I know it's overall people, but I'm a guy, so I talk about it from a guy's mm-hmm. perspective. We hate asking for help. And I don't know why we fight going to counseling, whether it's through a divorce. Mm-hmm. We just feel like it makes us weak. I think it's a sign of strength to be able to go, I need help. It is, no doubt about it. And a lot of folks look at it in that way uh, from the standpoint of the opposite. We're saying that, you know, if you do, then, well, you know, he's maybe not as much as we thought he was. Well, it takes a great deal of strength. Absolutely. It takes a great deal of, you know, just the, the commitment to, to be able to go and say that I'm going to open up to somebody else who don't know me, who, uh, you know, does, you know, I, they, you know, I don't want them to judge me. I don't want anybody to look at me and, you know, you don't want anybody to tell you about yourself or whatever. I'm like, hey, that ain't going to happen. You know, because a man up and on the street, you know, try to go up and do that or whatnot. It's on. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I mean it's, this Donkey Kong, brother, we're going we gonna to get some. We're moving we're gonna, furniture, we're gonna do as my dad yeah. used to say. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yes, it takes a great deal of courage to do so. And I didn't do it right away. Right. But later on, I did. Certainly, as I became a believer in Christ, it gave me a whole different degree of peace. Right. We can talk about the things that people may say to you, the people, the things that you're going to pat you on your back and, you know, you're going to get over this and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of grief that goes into when you don't realize how much grief that you have 
behind losing a career, an occupation. What's or, that quote at a Rocky uh, movie, The Beast in the Basement? It's um, still there. You don't know it's yeah, there. No, you don't know you don't. how to exercise mm-hmm. it yeah. till you go, and like yeah. you said, you, you, know, you did it after yeah. you, you, you became saved. So Psalms 5110 talks mm-hmm. about creating a new spirit in me, a new mind in me. Right. It's one of the things that I think that I still live by today because I still have to be recreated every day and knowing that I'm going to fall every day. I'm not going to be a perfect man. I'm not I'm not the perfect husband. I'm not the perfect dad all the time. I I'm got not, your wife's number. I'm She's my media sort of rep. I'm going to text her. So Gerald just said he was perfect. Oh, the, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, Did yeah, you know? The, and there'll be a there'll be a doghouse symbol sent to my phone or whatever. You're gonna be, <laughs> Clint, I hope you, you got room, man. I'm a big dude. I take up a big couch. But no, uh, to have the right people around you means something because I, I, when I got out of football and didn't realize, you know, that how many people were really there that I needed to get rid of. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it was like, man, it was almost like, hey, let's let's go ahead and, and start uh, another biblical boat, you know, because you, you had to clean your life up from that because you, you have a lot of reminders. Right. And you don't want the, the, the reminders to be, in a, you know, so much to where they, they don't allow you to grow and you have to grow afterwards. I mean, like it's almost like we were kids, you know, playing this kids game for a long point in time. But all of a sudden when it's over with, you got to grow up now. That, you got to let it go. Hearing you talk like this, and I do want to talk to you about the financial part because I think mm-hmm. that's a big deal. But hearing you talk like this, it's really, I think it's good if you're a listener because I'm taking something from it. The definition of strong and strength and tough guy sure does change as yep. you get older. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, oh. it took it, oh, it yeah. took a it took a mindset when you were twenty five to go do mm-hmm. what you did. At my, I'm fifty. Mm-hmm. I almost think it's mentally tougher to kind of navigate it now than it was back then. Because back then, I didn't know what was going on in your yeah. life. No, and we we didn't either as yeah. players. We didn't know. I mean, like when you talk about the, the finances, but let's let's go ahead and kind of yeah. jump into that yeah. because you know back in our day, it was there was always there was always someone who was trying to to get into your pockets because they knew, you know, as a football player, you were, you know, you're getting paid well. You had a little all cabbage, that. Yeah. You, you didn't have a whole lot of guys who were who were really there to really do you some good. These days, they've got a ton of guys. Even my, my my youngest son is now in there, is, is going to ready to go into this business to where he's, you know, he's, you know, investment banking and, and, oh. uh, and maybe trying to help some of the other guys maneuver some of these, these pitfalls that they run into because of the amount of money that they get. They don't realize how quick it can go. So financially, we didn't have, Guys who were like that, we I, I distinctly remember guys who we had we went through situations with that we thought that we were doing some good things with our money, mm-hmm. and we got took. That's what uh, I was. Uh, it's that trust it, it, you trusted yeah. them, and then we trusted you them, did. and we got took. I got took. Uh, there was a couple of guys that well known players who I got into deals with, and we all got took, and we were all sitting there with egg on our face because it was kind of like shame on us for letting it ha- happen. We didn't go to school for that. We didn't have symposiums for the younger players now. That they do. We didn't have guys coming around and say, "Hey, you know, listen." They just started um, handing you they, checks. They put the yeah. They, they <laughs> finally put together the NFL security aspect of it to where the, you know a lot of these people could be investigated. And we didn't have all those things. We didn't have all those things in place. Right. You know, they got there. You know, toward the end of our career, that's when all that was coming. But by that time, you've been in the league ten years and you try to do anything with your money somewhere along the line between that fifth and maybe sixth or seventh year, somebody's taking you with something. Well, they're going to have know? fees for this, fees for that. You don't know about this one. You don't understand. They to mm-hmm. explain this line item one of the things that guys literally shake and i shudder too because as i, I let it happen one time that was that power of attorney it, we, oh, you yeah. gave it to a couple of agents to do what they wanted to do because of in season we're trying to do some things you know we're trying to focus on playing and you know sure let me take you know handle your matters and all that sort of stuff well the power of attorney you gave to them and next thing you know you're like wait a minute i know what i've made i you know check wise and stuff what i've got but where did all this go and all that well you gave me you permission know, you gave me permission to do this and do that and some of these deals didn't fall through and of course you know my fees and all that sort of stuff it, a lot of things happen scrupulous a lot of things happen and nowadays they have i think a great department in the NFL to help some of these guys in all sports, baseball, basketball, football, yeah. they have everybody now around to where you, you can go online now and even look and to see what these guys' reputations are and contact the people who are involved with them to say, Hey, is this guy really on the up and up? What did this company do for you? You know, how are they, you know, help you and your financial goals and stuff in life? Are they putting together things that are going to benefit you for in the long run and after, after sports or whatnot? Are they looking at these things? So there are a lot of companies around now that take a great deal of pride in doing it. 
Right. And I'm, and I'm, I'm happy for some of these guys now, but we didn't have all that. I got a friend of mine, and I used to do his marketing and advertising. Uh, he went to East Ridge. He owns the Chattanooga Lookouts. John mm-hmm. Woods. He owns Southport mm-hmm. Capital, and he has like six offices around the country. Yeah. He also owns the Lookouts. Good guy. He's very big into sports, too. Yeah. We've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. I've actually been on his radio show, and that has come up. Once that happens to you, you know, you are surrounded by people that are always trying to get in your pockets, want to be seen with you. Mm-hmm. So not only do you leave football, right? Now, I don't know how to feel this adrenaline rush. I'm not really a quote unquote football player anymore. I don't really know who I can trust. Mm-hmm. And I'm they just wave by and say, hey, good luck. Yeah. So when you leave the NFL now, is there something to help people transition into quote unquote normal life? Yeah, okay. yeah they do. They even they had, didn't have that when you were there. No, though. Okay. no, they didn't. But they, um, you know, if I were to go on my NFL alumni site now, pull up all what they do have, they have actually, and almost in the, in the wording of it, transitioning back into the regular world. Yeah. Uh, and they have courses, they have classes, they have things to help guys to say, you know, hey, come here and uh, give us a couple of days so we can help you understand some of the things you're getting ready to face and what you need to be more cognizant of now that you weren't paying attention to when you were playing in the game. Yeah, because there's not music playing when you walk in the office. You know, you're not <laughs> no, walking through smoke no, screaming no, and, and no, no, you know, 70,000 yeah, people screaming. No. You've got all of a no. sudden memos and mm-hmm. sales quotas. You got, and, yeah, you've got all these different things. Some guys, you know, they, they have it, you know, where guys come out and you, you start to see a lot of guys now want to get into broadcasting. You a lot yeah. of those, some guys who've gone back and uh, they've done different programs end up one good friend of mine is a Mark Addicts who's now uh, actually looked upon as one of the most well-known authorities in, in a medical field. He finished all of his uh, medical residency stuff shortly after getting out of football. So there's a lot of different programs there. You still learn how to uh, channel that. You don't get to where you got without having drive and they mm-hmm. just need to have something in place to take that drive and say, now take it in this direction. Mm-hmm. When you look back on stuff now, though, uh, the concussions. Mm-hmm. Now, I already know your knees and shoulders and backs and you know, all that stuff hurts. But you look back on the concussions, is there some – I don't want to use the word bitterness. I'll, I won't put words in your mouth. Do you look back on it going, we should have known better or we did know better? Or do you just say that's part of the game and you just kind of move it on? Well, we never thought about it, no, honestly. We never sat down and had conversations about injuries, concussions, right. any of that sort of stuff. I never – I mean, in the locker room, in, a, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, training room, never. So it was more or less that in a game, if you, you're you playing and something happens or whatnot, we were still in the days where, you know, you pop a you know, the little the ammonia thing and you take a couple of sniffs and you get back in the game. If you were really bad off, guys could really tell, come staggering to the sideline and, you, you know, you look around and you don't know who your guy is and you hold up the three fingers and he's calling five and, you know, then it was Damn like, Sam Mills. it's like, you know, yeah, <laughs> sit down here, sit out over here and, you know, we, you're done for the day. It's something that, uh, again, the NFL, unfortunately, is trying to address now, but it, it was always prevalent in the game because of the game and, and the violent nature of it. I guess it wasn't taken as seriously. Yeah. Because most of the guys still came back and played. Most of the guys still But you were guys out are there warriors, though, man. That's what y'all do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that was the day where you can truly say it was, for lack of a better word, gladiator. Yeah. Is <laughs> okay. We went out and we played that way. It was. There was a certain amount of respect given to that, too. Yeah, you respect even the guys trainers, that played Even injured. the trainers, you know, that, you know, if they would come up and they would put a couple of fingers in your face or whatnot, the coach would run over to them and say, hey, can this guy get back in the game? Is he is he all right? Whatever. And the trainers, it was like, well, coach, let me just check him out one more time. Let me see him, you know, run over this way, run back this way. If you ran a straight line, you can go back to the game. that's autopilot. You can run yeah. a straight line all day. Yeah. yeah. So you can run a straight line and whatnot. It, it was like, okay, coach, he's good to go. <laughs> You out there on the field and you're still looking like I got 22 guys on the other side of the line. I'm, I got to play again. It's like when do they get three guys, Lawrence Taylor? You know, it's like oh, where are all these guys coming from? Hindsight's 2020. Looking back on it, knowing what we know now, it just seems silly because you go, we shouldn't be sending people back in there when you can't say your name and all that. But because I think it's better for Man, the sport now, Clint. That was just the game. Oh yeah, that was the way that we played the game. That's a good we attitude. Didn't, we didn't look at it as coach. Don't hold me out. I want to be about out there on the field. If I can physically look at you and I and say, you know what, I'm okay, I'm good, then let me go back in and play because I want to be out there and play. But I'm glad they have it different now. Though. Different Knowing now, what we know now about the human absolutely. brain, I'm really glad absolutely. that they do it. You've seen there's talented guys out there, and we don't want them feeling the way you guys do well, 20 years from now. Uh, you know, and it's, I've been through the testing and all that stuff, mm-hmm. and I have some things that are there. Nowhere near as like some of the other guys who I've seen who was in really bad shape. Right. And I'm thankful for that. Yeah. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to push anything for money and all that sort yeah. of stuff. I'm just thankful that, I'm, that I can, you know, function in, in the areas that I do. Yeah. It's great that they've changed. They've gotten to 
the most important aspect of all of it nowadays they got into the moms and you know when mom don't want little johnny out there getting banged around and next thing you know coming to the house you know all kind of cuckoo or whatnot that's what they've gotten to they've got well, to, to have the mothers to say you need to look at this a lot closer yeah you know dads too i mean we wanted to understand all this but at the same time we still want to be able to say you know let's let, hey son you want to go out and play football it's fine with me i'm going to go out there and support you it's, it's one of the best feelings most dads can have to oh, see yeah. their son in something that's highly competitive whether it's football or what's What's the other thing with the, the net and the oh, thing or whatever? Lacrosse, lacrosse or rugby, or rugby or whatever. <laughs> you know, if you want to do those yeah. things, that's fine with me. You know, uh, but they do come with a possible long term effect. Well, and I do like the fact they're teaching them how to tackle a little differently now. And you're not yeah, don't don't trying. launch your head. They're, yeah, they're trying. <laughs> I like the dismiss. they're trying. <laughs> it's but, not once you get in the heat of battle, it's hard to go. Okay, I'm going to turn my head this way and launch them. It's we've had this conversation before. Yeah, and I really applaud. The NFL for trying to have their heads up program and trying to say that, well, we're doing something. We're trying to show the coaches and, and the younger players. And the moms. That, and the moms that yeah. we're trying to do something to protect their kids and the kids to protect themselves. But, again, when, I'm, when you're talking about a reactionary game as football is, all that stuff goes right out the window. Like I said, I applaud them for trying to do something. But sometimes I just show up at games. I don't want to sit back there and, and uh, have anybody make a big deal of seeing me at a game or whatnot. But I'll, I'll sit back there almost incognito or whatnot. And I yeah. like to watch and see what coaches are teaching. And I'm telling you, man, I, I've known of guys who – gone through the program, gone through the heads up program. And when you see them out there on the field and you see what they're trying to, you know, it's like they're, they're so focused on winning and that's what the game is still all about. It's about winning yep. that those things don't count when it comes to winning. It's like, you better get in there and make a play. How many times did you hear you stick your head in there? there. Yeah. Put your head in there. Get in there. You know, like, hmm. you know the, what, what are you afraid of? Go out there and play. And, and it's like, those are the cues that you need to hear. When you hear a coach start talking about all that sort of stuff, that's when you get concerned. Yep. Because that guy is more focused on winning than he is the kids out there having fun and being safe. Especially knowing that 99.9% of everybody playing is not going to go to your and level. I've seen it happen before. Is it the best option? No. Yeah. But it's something. Something. And and I think that still a lot of these coaches, when they see things like that going in the game, they, they need to make a point of it to say something because that's the, that's the only way that it's really going to It'll change, change. Next 10, 15, 20 years, the kids that are six now hopefully will be a little uh, smarter. Than they'll be playing Jets in football by that time. That'll be two And every to... time they'll have a uniform on, they, it actually will <laughs> be looking like they have a shirt. But just before they get ready to hit, it'll blow up. It, oh, look at it. It'll be like an <laughs> airbag. It'll be an airbag. <laughs> Every time somebody gets ready to get hit, it's going to. Hey, if that's the case, be. I may be able to. I still may have a future then. If you're going to start getting airbags oh, on people. Oh, yeah, right. What do you yeah. got going on now, man? What, what's happening in your world right now that man, you're doing? Well, actually, I'm entertaining the fact of going back and doing some broadcasting. I kind of set out after I had um, uh, last year. I was kind of burnt out from kind of doing stuff. And I've been back in contact with some of my old stomping ground people Good. Uh, in Atlanta. And also looking at maybe doing some broadcasting within the uh, either ACC or SEC. Good for you. So I'm, I'm looking to do that. But in the meantime, I still go around and I speak on my faith. I speak on my testimony of what God has done for me and where I've come from and, and really what I've been able to do to, to help young men to try to be that, just young men. There's still a, a big disconnect now with with the church sometimes and young people. We try to go around, at least I try to go around and offer my time and offer my testimony up to anybody who'll listen. Do you have a website or something people can get hold of you? If not, I'll post it on our Facebook page on how to get hold of you. If they yeah. want to hear you come yeah, speak. Yeah, actually, I'm redoing it now. as the guy who, um, Mike Wadle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wadle and yeah. Yeah, he's uh, redoing my, my site right Man, now. Man, they're good so people. When so you got good uh, folks yes. on it then. Yeah, he's a good man of God. I, I love him. We, we have quite a few uh, interesting conversations on Well, time, if anybody so. wants to get a hold of you, I can tell them to contact me. Yeah, you and can I'll do that. Up with yeah, you until and, your uh, website's yeah, up. Until that's up, because I'll definitely uh, have that Excuse done me. here. We were just talking about it yesterday, and, and we'll get it all back up. It's still there, but I just don't want, want to, I don't want to put it all up there just yet. So nah. I'll uh, hold off on that, but it is forthcoming. Well, this uh, the second time wasn't too yeah. bad. No, it wasn't too bad. You See, know, I, I was trying to make sure that I, I didn't let myself go again. That's, no, you know, no. I, 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 I hit the right button. God is always working on me, man. So I try to clean it up. <laughs> no, no. I, <laughs> on your I, show. <laughs> I just want to say this. I appreciate you coming back in. Yes. I get to ask you questions as a fan, but finding out about that transition and hearing the struggle you went through most of this podcast, everybody can, nobody can relate to the NFL mm -hmm. part, right? But everybody can relate to the struggle part. Yeah. And that is something good for all of us to hear that you go through that struggle but there's ways to get through it, getting some help. And then, then I also like the fact that 
Mike Singletary didn't want anything to do with you. I kind of like that. Fact <laughs> you, a you, know, you're a bear hater. You didn't like the bears. No, I love the whatever. bears. Oh, okay. And I like okay. Mike Singletary. Yeah. When you grow up, you mm-hmm. get this this image of Mike Singletary, mm-hmm. and he's you know, scared of you know. Well, like there, there are certain players. I'm telling you, um, we always used to say, you know what? When we go out there to play against them, we're going to find out if your heart's pumping peanut butter or not. You know. <laughs> so <laughs> I was never. I was. I can't ever say. And I like I said because of where I played the game yeah. and me growing up in the way that I did, it was always a challenge. Right. I, I love the challenge. We love watching you man i loved it and you know what it's still a blessing that people still remember oh yeah you know i'm tickled to death you know that some of these older guys come around it's like that's my era running back you know you guys Absolutely. don't know nothing about it you don't know about that era of players you know and they speak about us in, in such high regard and i love that because it's not the, just me yeah. it's all the guys that i play with I, that's what I, I i appreciate more than anything is that i played in an era where those guys they to me were the absolute pinnacle of football, even though some of these guys nowadays, and I'm, I don't always, and we, when I get together with guys at the games now, and we criticize all these new age oh, guys, yeah. the, the, the Ray Lewis and all that, we, we talk about how much, oh man, we would have, we would have just, you know, they, they didn't want they, nothing to do with They me. didn't want anything to do with this. And everybody seems to think that, I guess, probably their own generation, but I thoroughly enjoyed playing with those guys. I, I really but your did. story now, and, and we'll, we'll end it up on this, but your story yeah. now is not only part of that past, but that struggle. You never know how many kids you've touched. Because of the opportunity, you know, you look back when you were 18 and it kind of all comes into place. There's a 14 year old that may have heard you talk last month or last Mm -hmm. year, and you'll never know what happens to them down the road from that Mm -hmm. one thing you said. Yeah. So that's, that's where we're at. It's helping people now, taking what you've been through and helping people. One thing real quick. Yeah. yeah. And and it's something that really is, is, uh, when I look back on it and when you just, when you're talking about what I may have done, I was at a meeting one time and, um, uh, I can't remember. I wasn't there for this to speak, but I was there as a guest at uh, at a, a a function. It was in Atlanta, and it was a it was a business thing. And this was you know years after I had gotten out. Young lady walks up to me. She's dressed, you know, it looks like a somebody's CEO or someone's look, you know, just a boss or whatever. Yeah, you just see it all over. But she was like, "You do not know. You do not know me. You do not remember me." But I went to a, a, some speaking that I had that I had done. I spoke to a group of kids, and she said it, that changed my life. At that point in time, and I don't, you know, I don't remember what I could have spoken about at the yeah. time. No more than the fact that I, I know that I wasn't totally in my faith at the, at the point, but I know that I, I was trying to help other kids understand, the, you know, the direction that they could go, be better, and and speaking, you know, trying to be successful in something else, and and trying to, you know, to, of course, get them a different path to go. And she said that, that that changed her life. Wow. And now this girl was was like a she was like a, an executive vice president of some company or whatnot. Yeah that was there at that and I'm like I know of course I wouldn't have known you very well but she she described herself to me and whatnot and I was like holy cow I said you know what God is good and think of how many people she's going to touch yeah so yeah. that's kind of why it all brings it together. And that's that kind of why I'm glad we're doing That was one of the best things I think I've ever felt, you know, in my in my life was uh, to know that I really did make a difference to someone. Well man, that's good yeah. to hear. Thank really you for coming in, Dave. Clint man, I'm glad to do it. I, I hope that everything is is a okay yeah. and we don't we don't have to see Gerald. This, this can sound you like know, it's I in a tin can. I, if I see your number pop up here in the next I'm not calling you. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just, God darn it. I'm just going to shut the whole Clint thing down. Again. I'm like, man, why don't you turn the volume you up know, or something or whatever? <laughs> just Replace say, yeah. the batteries or something. <laughs> what, what do you have to do, man? Come on. Or just get somebody smarter. Yeah, I'm about to go and get Lynn Bird to help you out or something. Don't do that. <laughs> now you're just insulting me. I appreciate it very much. Hey, guys, thanks right, for listening, buddy. and uh, we'll be back next time. Find us, share us, and listen off. Thanks for listening to During the Break. If you have any questions or suggestions, shoot me an email at clint at connectchattanooga.com. That's clint at connectchattanooga.com, or you can private message me on our Facebook page. If we get started, it would be extremely helpful if you could rate and review the podcast on iTunes. That will help us get more listeners. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, share it with your friends, and look for the next episode every Friday at 11 a.m.